I drag my students by the nose, jot down really quickly what is, I started with Republic, so we'll continue. What is, of course, the reference here that's being made to Plato Book 7? Remember our cave allegory. You have a bunch of individuals sitting in a darkened cave, assuming that shadows on a wall are real. And, of course, the Emancipation Project, the learning, requires a certain kind of dragging out into the light of the sun. Here it is, leading students around by the nose. This is, of course, also going to be the slam at Socrates and the quote-unquote Socratic method, which always begins with <laughs> questions and then leads to often not answers, but more questions. In other words, what are we supposed to get out of all this stupidity? And he says, it's kind of a game that I play with my students, leading them around by the nose. All our science and art think about the way in which Guta is going to summarize all of the university, all of our high school. In our high school, there is science and there is art. Think about how both of those domains capture pretty much everything we study. For example, can you right now write down on your paper something that you would study either at the high school level or at the university level that somehow wouldn't fall into one of those two camps, science and art. And of course, if you'll think about it, that's the kind of conflict after that differentiation of the value spheres we were talking about between arts, morals, and science that's going to be a product, uh, product of the scientific enlightenment. So in other words, he says, everything that we do in both of those domains, science and art, we know nothing. Now that is an interesting indictment of the educational system. Twain maybe said it even better when he said, my schooling keeps getting in the way of my learning. One or two students have said, exactly. He said it the best I could have ever said it. Why do we have to do this wretched thing called school? Because in the end, doesn't it just kind of turn us into wretched fools, idiots? How am I any better off now that I've learned all this stuff in AP than I was before? See, I want you to realize that that's a legitimate question. And it is a question which doesn't so easily go away. And for young Faust or old Faust here, he says, of course. Now he comes back and restates. I am smarter than all the shysters, the doctors and teachers and scribes and Christers. In other words, when anyone comes to me and starts to have a conversation, I can always do one of these and go, dude, <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to hear. No, 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 I need to tell you about this <coughs> book called Plato's Republic. And he goes, let me just recite everything about Republic. I'll, at the beginning, at, I went down to the Piraeus and I'll just start quoting every line. No, no, there's this book called the Bible which will save you all kinds of... In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The book of Eli comes to mind, that film. The entire Bible memorized. Yeah, he says, I got it all memorized. I know the stuff better than they know the stuff who are telling me how this stuff's going to save my life in some way. And he's like, yeah, you don't even just sit down now and stop talking. Because I already know it all. And I'm telling you, none of it helps. None of it. Zero. Now, let's come up with words for this attitude. That is, in the end, going to be in the French, the word ennui, boredom. <sighs> boredom. It may be closer to despair. I wish it wasn't this way, but I think it is this way. <sighs> Optimistic or pessimistic. See, right? A very pessimistic view. Idealized versus a realistic view. Most would argue this is realism. No scruple nor doubt could make me ill. Ah, this is interesting because he knows it all. I'm not afraid of the devil or hell. By the way, this is of course going to be our great statement of skepticism, agnosticism, and of course extreme positions we call atheism. In other words, don't try and tell me 
that I've got to believe in some myth or some story, or some book, or some idea, because dude, I already know all that stuff, and I'm telling you, it doesn't mean anything to me. But before I also lack, uh-oh, see, notice this. It's not only that I know everything, he says, but there is something fundamentally now missing from my life. But therefore, I also lack all delight. Sometimes, by the way, this word has been translated out of the German just simply joy. We think of the great Schiller poem and, of course, Beethoven's rendition in the fourth movement of the Ninth Symphony, Ode to Joy. And that idea that you could just be totally elated, that yay kind of thing. And Faust admits, yeah, I, don't, I don't know that. The great atheist Voltaire, working through one of the classic knockdown arguments against the existence of God, talking with his friend, his buddy, after days and days of working with this grappling with the idea of a belief in God, coming to the idea finally in the most coherent of logic for Voltaire, that it is completely asinine to believe in, in God and theology, was talking with his buddy, beautiful morning, sitting in the courtyard, and an old peasant woman walks by, carrying a water bucket, singing. And Voltaire is irritated at her. He hasn't been sleeping for a while, and he says, Madam, what is it you have to be happy about this morning? And she says, look, look what God has made. It's so beautiful. The sunshine, the trees, the butterflies, the birds are singing. It's a beautiful day, and it's all been created for me by God. How couldn't I be happy? And she just went on her way. Voltaire turned to his buddy and said, For all of our knowledge, that we will never know again in our life. Pure joy. The joy of convicted belief. Hmm. He says, Do not fancy that I know anything right. Do not fancy that I could teach or assert what would better mankind or might convert? He says, I don't have any hope that ideas can somehow improve the human condition because I'm pretty much convinced that ideas can't improve the human condition. He says, I also have neither money nor treasures nor worldly honors or heavenly pleasures. No dog would want to live longer this way. There will be all kinds of irony if you will mention dog. Of course, Plato liked to talk in Republic about Doing logic chopping is like little puppies biting on each other's ears, but here in a little bit, when Mephistopheles shows up, he will show up with uh -huh, a dog. When we come back to have our further conversation, then we'll talk about the choice of Faust with Mephistopheles. And we'll ask, what would you choose if you could have anything, literally, you wanted? What would you choose? Thank you.